the following topic, which is very related to yeah, mystical experiences. Um, so the structure of the presentation, essentially I'm gonna cover three things that are very related and oftentimes confused with each other. First is the metaphysics of personal identity and like various models that exist about that. The second one is the phenomenology of personal identity, like why does it feel like you can become one with everything related to yeah, mystical experience or, or you know, uh, internal unity and things like that. And then the third one is trying to connect the two a little bit. Uh, the third one is like very, very speculative. I am much more confident on, yeah, kind of like how much it makes sense uh, for the other two in particular. So there's this philosopher called Daniel Kolak who came up with a classification for beliefs of personal identity. And personal identity here doesn't mean, let's say, how you see yourself relative to others or your place in society or your self-esteem or anything of that sort. It really refers to the kind of like very core ontological question of who are you and why are you different than others? Why are you in the body that you are right now and not where I am right now? Uh, or why are you here today and not yesterday? Like, wh what's up with that? So essentially there are kind of like three very broad clusters of views about personal identity that he identified. The first one is called closed individualism. This is the standard common sense view that you start existing when you're born and you stop existing when you die. Alternatively, maybe you, um, you know, have a soul and so maybe you go to heaven or hell, or in a reincarnation model, you know, maybe you go through many cycles of life and death. But the point is that you're some kind of like segment or line that is like ontologically separated from everybody else, but you're the same over time. Uh, this view, at least within a physicalist paradigm, has a lot of problems because uh, how do you deal with, for example, you know, duplication, teleportation, fusion, fusion experiments. There's a lot of like thought experiments in philosophy that challenges kind of like the ontological status of this idea of closed individualism. Uh, and I would argue that one of the m probably like significant real psychedelic insights that people have on, on exotic states of consciousness is actually that closed individualism is maybe not true. Or at least like you get the opening of the possibility that, hey, maybe <laughs> it just feels like I am the same person from moment to moment and I'm different from others, but maybe that's just a perception. Like, I, I do think that's a very valuable perspective. Uh, I made this image to kind of like symbolize um, how I think of closed individualism. You could imagine, okay, this is the universe and there's a lot of different segments and each of those segments is a different observer and they're ontologically different. You know, every observer is different, but they carry over in time. The second view is called empty individualism. Uh, this is the view that Hume and Buddha and Parfit and David Pierce takes, which is the idea that you're just a time slice. You're just a moment of experience. From one moment to the next actually is a completely different witness. An ontologically separate entity is essentially uh, inhabiting your brain from moment to moment. Um, and actually, if you take this very seriously in meditation, you can get really trippy pretty fast uh, because you identify just like, like with the now, 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 that's what I am. And uh, yeah, the, you know, Buddhists might say like, yeah, that's actually the deep truth. There's actually no continuity. The self is an illusion. Um, and I think this is a fairly consistent view. Uh, if you take it seriously, it tends to be pretty depersonalizing and weird. So don't necessarily recommend it, but it's like, yeah, uh, it's philosophically coherent. Uh, there is of course a problem of apparent continuity, right? Like why is it that it does feel like you carry over from moment to moment? Like empty individualism would have to explain that. But I think it has ways to do so. Uh, if we discretize moments of experience and essentially there's like information correlation between each of the moments of experience, there's a way to kind of like reconstruct the illusion of continuity based on, yeah, discrete time slices. Uh, this is how I symbolize it. It's kind of, yeah, the universe would be this just gigantic collection of tiny moments of experience. And that's like the deep truth. Whereas, yeah, the sense of continuity and unity between ourselves and between people is all completely illusory. Actually, the deep truth is just there's time slices. <laughs> that's, that's all there is. And then finally, you have open individualism. And that this is the view that we are all one consciousness. Um, lots of proponents, you know, obviously the Bhagavad Gita, a lot of Eastern traditions, we're all Shiva underneath. 
Um, but also, yeah, a lot of like very yeah, rational, well-regarded people like Schopenhauer or Einstein. I mean, you might be surprised, but it turns out like Einstein was definitely an open individualist. He definitely believed we were all one consciousness. He, he wrote about that. Uh, Daniel Kolek, uh, Freeman Dyson, famous physicist, if you have heard of the Dyson sphere. Yeah, he, he, he thinks or he thought open individualism was true. Um, and, uh, however, it does have like one strange problem, which is like, how is it possible that you can exist in multiple places at once? I mean, if we are all one consciousness, that means that I'm here and I'm also there and there and there and there. And how is this multiplicity compatible with, you know, kind of like a sensible notion of, uh, identity? Um, but as I'll explain maybe towards the end, um, there's ways of actually making sense of this in a coherent, rational, defensible way. Uh, and this is the way I represent it. You could imagine it as like there's one universal consciousness, one observer that is kind of behind everything. And we are like little openings uh, that that one consciousness has into itself in a way, into different configurations of itself. Um, now, also, you know, if you believe these, it leads to pretty trippy places. Uh, I spent several years like meditating on this, and it's pretty strange. Uh, it has benefits and drawbacks, so I wouldn't say it's like it's only positive. Uh, and the thing that I've actually have converged in terms of like how I prefer to live my life is uh, a, a fourth option, which is what I call the Goldi Goldilocks zone of oneness. Um, which essentially is kind of like an integration of all three views. <laughs> And so there is absolutely a sense in which we're all one, I think, because we're all part of the same fields of physics, you know, it's, it's everything is integrated. But also there's a very real sense in which each moment of experience is kind of a different observer because it has different information content, you know, different causal effects. You can, in some sense, say, yeah, there is moments of experience and that's a feature of reality. It's important to acknowledge. And then also there is continuity of information within a given brain. So. I think they all are th true in different ways, um, complementary, um, and it's a good state of consciousness to cultivate. I think the superposition of all three is what I would actually recommend to cultivate, independent of what the deep truth is, which I'm going to get to in, in a bit. Uh, this takes me to, yeah, kind of like what I think is the, um, uh, the big plot of reality. Like once you think in terms of personal identity, think in terms of consciousness, realize that value is actually an expression of consciousness. The reality, the big plot, like the very big thing we're all doing, whether we realize it or not, is actually this crazy, fractal, multi-level competition between consciousness and replicators. So replicators essentially are like patterns that just want to make copies of themselves, independently of how valuable or disvaluable they are. Whereas consciousness is, yeah, the witness, like who you are right now. And, you know, the values for consciousness are actually avoiding suffering, uh, experiencing bliss and happiness. Uh, love, and uh, essentially I think we, we want a reality where the values of consciousness are held, hopefully in a synergistic way with replicators, but you know, there are replicator takeover scenarios where essentially reality just becomes colonized by just one repeating pattern, you know, at the absolute <laughs> most extreme case you have that in terms of nanotechnology, right, like a tiny, tiny uh, probe could essentially copy itself to the universe and then it's maybe game over for consciousness. But there's like much more, uh, I think, like plausible scenarios where essentially, yeah, we, we kind of like develop a society that has forgotten about the deep nature of consciousness, believes in its own narrative as if it was like the ontological truth. Um, so yeah, coming, coming back to open individualism that, hey, like there is a sense in which we're all one, even yeah, people from different cultures, uh, different, you know, animals from different species, uh, their suffering matters just as much. Um, because yeah, it is kind of the one consciousness experiencing it. So, well, so that is kind of like metaphysics. Now I'm going to talk about like the phenomenology of this and, uh, very much connected to, yeah, like internal unity and mysticism. So again, like one of the key things that we do at Qualia Research is actually take phenomenology very seriously, A, and B, uh, essentially having this very, very close collaboration with extremely hardcore psychonauts that, you know, we're talking the thousands of uh, trips. Um, you know, I, I talk to, you know, regularly with people for, for, for example, have taken 5-MeO DMT at high doses every day for six months. I actually know three people in that category. Um, the same with like DMT and Salvia and they've tried all the combinations as well. And um, they're very sane and very rational people. Uh, <laughs> It, tur it turns out, it, it, I mean, you know, uh, like a very fair warning, I, I do tend to say that DMT in general 
I think it's I think of it as an epistemological hand grenade. In like, <laughs> in general, I think if you give somebody DMT, in general, their models of reality will become a little bit worse. Um, but no, if you do it systematically and you cross compare across trips and you take it seriously and you don't believe in your own delusions and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, actually, you do get a better model of reality after a while. <laughs> um, and essentially, yeah, uh, that's kind of like what uh, what we cultivate. So we have this thing called Phenomenology Club uh, by invitation, where yeah, essentially we gather about like 50 extremely, extremely hardcore psychonauts with extremely vast experiences, very large vocabulary, and so we actually can say like a pretty substantial things about like the subjective differences between experiences that wouldn't come out of you know a questionnaire. Uh, for example, <laughs> what I was telling about earlier today about like for example. Uh, DMT, like how you actually get a hyperbolic geometry, higher dimensional geometry, you actually need a mathematician to look at those patterns to tell you, yes, that's a you know, hyperbolic symmetry group. You need the expertise to be able to recognize that. You can't just give it to somebody and expect to get that kind of like quality of data. So based on that, a very, very important, what I would say is kind of like quintessential, excellent contrast to try to understand the nature of mystical experiences is the very precise difference between DMT and 5-MeO-DMT. Um, let me explain what I think is their difference. So uh, I wrote an article called, yeah, the nine lenses for like the difference between DMT and 5-MeO-DMT. There's many ways in which they're different. Broadly speaking, 5-MeO-DMT uh, is much more mystical, uh, unitive, whereas, 5 -MeO, whereas a regular DMT, quote unquote, regular DMT and then DMT, takes you to like strange realms and is full of entities and is full of complexity. Okay, so I have this like super simple, super simple explanation for like why they're so different, even though they're like very similar molecularly and in terms of neurotransmitters, uh, you know, receptor affinity. There are some differences, but they're not huge. So if you put um, 12 clocks, you know, the pendulum clocks, uh, I didn't make a slide for this, unfortunately, but if you put like 12 clocks on a wall, and they're, you know, they're kind of like oscillating and they start out desynchronized. After a while, they will actually become synchronized. And the reason is that they are sending tiny mechanical vibrations through the wall. So it's kind of like a shared medium through which they can actually achieve their lowest energy configuration, which is like full synchrony. Now, if you have 10,000 clocks on a wall, they will never synchronize. Uh, instead, what you will see is like maybe spontaneous clusters of synchrony here and there, and maybe traveling waves, you know, kind of like the Mexican wave on, on you know, like on, on a football, uh, soccer, like you have like that, that type of phenomena, but you don't get kind of like global synchronization. Now, if you start adding connections between those clocks, uh, kind of like shorten, shortening, increasing their surface area or their, their internal communication interconnectivity, there are two phase transitions. The first transition is that every clock belongs to a cluster of coherence, meaning that now like things are synchronized, but they're divided into clusters. Each cluster is synchronized with itself. They're not globally synchronized. And then if you add even more connections between the clocks, then there's like another final step where there's another phase transition where all of them become synchronized. So my very simple tentative hypothesis for the difference between DMT and 5-MeO-DMT is that they both increase the interconnectivity of your brain, but DMT does it only to the extent that you activate the attractor of competing clusters of coherence, whereas 5-MeO-DMT does it all the way up to the attractor of global coherence. Now, global coherence, I would claim, actually feels like oneness, feels like global unity, feels like unity consciousness. Um, whereas competing clusters of coherence, you know, each of the cluster of coherence, I was talking about fields in the earlier talk, uh, that's kind of like the better formalization, but essentially, yeah, each cluster of coherence kind of functions as a different witness of the scene. Um, and so it actually is an ecosystem, right? Like the DMT state is not really just a state, it's actually a complex ecosystem of patterns competing for your attention, and I think that is actually just what it feels like to have these competing clusters of coherence attractor being instantiated in the nervous system. Uh, on the other hand, you know, a peak, you know, 5-MeO DMT state is, yeah, coherence across the entire predictive coding hierarchy. And these are the kind of images that might replicate a little bit this feeling. You know, you get like Indra's net where everything reflects everything else perfectly, fractally. You also get this sense of infinite space or infinite light complete coherence, the void, 
all of those are kind of like, at least conceptually, it makes sense that they would happen when you have dissolved all of the internal boundaries. And the reason why we have internal boundaries naturally is because we have competing clusters of coherence. So if you only have one global coherence, internally that's going to feel like there's no boundaries. And because we represent the world, <laughs> uh, we use our experience to you know, represent the universe and the things around it and the people around us. If you dissolve internal boundaries, that feels like you're becoming one with everything. Now, in some sense, this is okay, like somewhat reductionistic and, and kind of like saying, yeah, yeah, the feeling of unity is kind of hallucinatory. Although at the very end, I'm actually going to explain like in what way. I, it actually may be very ontologically significant as well. But um, yeah, I mean, essentially at a very high level, uh, because DMT would be causing these competing clusters of coherence, it tends, it lends itself to essentially generating very complex models of reality. You know, things such as like, this is a simulation or the Greys and the, um, the Russians are plotting, <laughs> Ra and Thor uh, are real, they live in Jupiter. Um, Again, DMT is an epistemological hand grenade, and um, if somebody has taken it maybe 20 times and is not super serious about figuring out how it works, uh, they do believe, they, it, it is likely you, you might believe in this because you feel these sort of things very strongly uh, in the moment. Whereas, 5 mu DMT um, massively simplifies your models of reality because of this global coherence. You simply don't have enough complexity in your experience to actually represent complex metaphysics. So you default to things such as we are all God or everything is love. One is, is all you need. And I actually think that, okay, like if what, you're, if what you care about is like an accurate model of reality, you probably want to be in between. Um, I do suspect there are people who are like chronic underfeeders, just naturally people who are chronic overfeeders. My sense is like, yeah, if somebody's a chronic overfeeder, probably 5-MeO-DMT might help them and, and vice versa. So you can probably tailor the psychedelic therapy based on what kind of epistemological disorder somebody might have <laughs> to begin with. Um, okay, so finally, why, why do I think, yeah, there's actually something very deeply ontologically, perhaps real about the unity consciousness. So there's this um, uh, article I wrote about how to actually create an object that will manifest uh, hyperbolic geometry. Um, you know, it's a, it's a neat idea. Essentially what you do is you combine these like uh, infinite mirrors together with uh, what's called gradient index optics. So you know if you have like two materials with different index of refraction and you shine a laser, essentially it, um, it bends, right? And it bends at an angle that is determined with an equation based on the difference in the index of refraction. If you smoothly blend two materials with two different index of refraction um, from A to B all the way through in a, in a very smooth way, essentially what will happen is that the light will bend in a continuous way as opposed to having a sharp boundary. So one of the, the models that we actually play with at QRI is that, yeah, the brain actually, like the, the reason why you can represent perspective and you can represent distances is because of variable index of refraction in local field potentials in the brain. And I mean, essentially, when you are in a hyper coherent state like 5 mo DMT and you have dissolved all of the boundaries, there is a sense in which that is kind of equivalent to a ray of light being actually in an infinite, infinite undifferentiated space. Um, and in that sense, it is kind of indistinguishable uh, from, let's say, like light in, in vacuum. You know, maybe at the absolutely most fundamental level, it might be the same physical state, in which case, yeah, actually, maybe 5 mo DMT might, way, might, be, might be a way to know what it feels like to be empty space. I think like, that wouldn't be uh, an insane result at this point. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I think like, the last thing I'll mention, on, uh, and this is the next to last uh, slide, is that, uh, um, yeah, I mean, essentially, once you start thinking about like, okay, yeah, you do inhabit a tiny world simulation, and then these different psychedelics, kind of what they're doing is modulating parameters such as the energy, complexity, integration, competing clusters of coherence and global coherence. Um, I think you can explain a lot and you can make very interesting predictions. It's essentially what we are doing at QRI, that like, hey, we're not analyzing these experiences just from a you know, semantic perspective. Like, hey, does it feel like you're one with everything or not? We're analyzing them from the point of view of like, how is the energy flow in your visual field? And does it feel like there's boundaries or not? And then anchoring that to, hey, when we, the energy flow was very smooth, did that feel like we were all one? And so far, the tentative answer is, is yes. 
Um, and yeah, this is just to, to conclude the uh, Indra's net. I very much think, uh, you know, people have this metaphysical idea. Yeah, everything reflects everything else, uh, you know, in Indian, Indian religions. Um, but no, actually, Indra's net is a actual, real, stable attractor state of various psychedelic experiences, especially DMT, because, yeah, when you have these competing clusters of coherence, actually a very stable configuration is when each of those clusters of coherence has a tiny model of the entirety of the experience, because in that way it can predict perfectly how the experience behaves. That's a very stable state, and uh, I don't know, ch check it out if you, <laughs> if you encounter it, uh, email me, and uh, yeah, we can talk about how to explain it with fields. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.